I pray. And, and I, there's, there's a song. I don't know how old it was. I remember it when I was a kid, so I guess it's getting older. Um, I need you, Lord, I need you. Come, Holy Spirit, I need you. And I'd sing that song, and the Spirit of God would remind me, he goes, Brent, it's okay to sing that, but I never want you to forget that I've never left you. I'm always here. You don't have to massage me right to get me to show up. My promise is good. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. When Jesus sent me, I've never left. And that ever-abiding presence in my life is such a comfort because I know that at any moment I can declare who he is, whether I feel like it or not, and it's the truth, and that he is there, and that he is moving. And when the enemy comes in, like a flood, to try to wash me down the drain, I need to begin to just declare who he is, not so I can feel better, but I'm submitting to God and I'm resisting the enemy. And here's what scripture says, when I do that, right, he's going to flee. So I kind of had a, just a funny picture, and I'll move on, but it, it was, you know, um, sometimes, unfortunately, I think we can allow worship to become the mood-altering time that we have before the beatings that pastor's going to give us. So let's not do that. <laughs> let's not do that, right? I, I know I want to feel good. I do. Can I? So when I rededicated my life to the Lord in 1992, um, I came into a church that really was in the midst of a, a revival. The Spirit of God was moving in powerful ways. Amazing things were happening. Cancers were being healed, blind eyes. I mean, the only thing I didn't see in that church was a dead person raised up. And who knows that it may not have happened in service, and we didn't know. I don't know. But it, it, was, it was a genuine move of the Spirit of God. And uh, there were some things happening, and I mean, just people being filled with joy. And I looked around, and I got mad at God. I'm like, why can't this happen to me? Why can't I have the feelings? And I got to tell you the truth. God has spoken to me more times in the bathroom than any place else. I don't know why. And I can take you right to the place in this bathroom where God spoke to me multiple times, and I happened to be in this bathroom. I actually left the service. I was aggravated. God's just touching all these people. And I'm not saying it was all real, but I'm saying a good majority of it, I knew the people, and like, these people aren't fakers. Like, they're looking for attention. Spirit of God just touched them. And I mean, they're just, full. and I'm like, God, how come I can't have that? I want that. And he said, Brent, because you're, you have an addictive personality. And you would just fall in love with the feeling, and you would forget who I am. And that marked me. That marked me. I, so I understood my tendency at that point to lean that direction where I go, God, I'm always going to try to replicate what felt good, but I forget how I... The feeling came. The feeling came not because I was trying to get it, but just simply because I was declaring who you were and you fell on me. That was a, that was a, a byproduct of the declaration, right? right? Let it be a byproduct of the declaration. If you get a feeling, you get a feeling. If you don't, God is glorified and the, man, and the enemy's put in his place, right? That's where we want him to be. <clears throat> Amen. All right. Time to move on. Pastor Brent, you're not going to get very far today, but you know we do have food here, so we don't have to go far for our food, so we might, we might make it. Are you ready? Two. All right. You get right in line behind me, the rest of you. All right. Are you ready? Yeah. That's a little bit. All right. So over the last couple of gatherings, um, we've been examining the substance of this altar, the altar of God. Um, and, and this altar came through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's, it's the altar that is put in place. It really, I, I would say that Jesus gives us the first real glimpse of it in John 13, where he says, a new command I give you. You know, I don't, I don't know how many times I've read over that, and it just never grabbed me. Like when Jesus says a new command, that, that should be a point that I stop and spend some time and go, hmm, what did he say here? But Jesus identifies this altar. And, and it continues from that time through his death and resurrection. Jesus died and rose again. 
to redeem us from death. Now, this has to do with that altar because the substance of the altar, remember what we said, the, remember what I said, you didn't say it, I said it, the substance of the altar, the building material of the altar is God's purposes and plans for his creation. For you, you're a creation command. God spoke you. Psalms 139 says, before yet one day that you lived, he wrote them all down in his book. He knows you. He created you. You are made in his image. When God said, let it be, and it was, he had purpose. In the building stones of God's altar for us from John 13, I mean, from the beginning on, but we begin to see this altar more clearly in John 13, when Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another the way I've loved you. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. So not only do we have the altar, we have authority and we have the ability to do the commission we're going to receive to go make disciples. You can't make disciples if you're not a disciple. That that was, Jesus was a rabbi. He was speaking rabbinic terms to these people who understood exactly what he was saying. You, You can't make a disciple unless you are a disciple. And Jesus said, this is how people are going to know you rest under my authority to make disciples. That you will love one another the way you have been loved. So no longer... Is it about you exerting your strength and trying harder to love me and to love your neighbor? Now you are to love out of the great love that has been pressed on you. Now it's about my strength. I'm giving you a greater love. A greater love has come upon you. Now become a conduit of that love. Right? This isn't about try harder. This isn't the try harder gospel. This is recognizing what God has done and saying, oh God, Give me the grace to live in this and to abide in your love and to walk in it because I can't do it on my own. Hold me there. Spirit of God, lead me. Empower me to be a conduit of your love. I want to worship at that altar because that's your purpose for me in Christ. And that's the substance of this next statement. Jesus died and rose again to redeem us from death. You know, redeem means to buy back right? To buy back, to buy us back, to pay the penalty of death and to revive, right? If you're dead, you need to be revived, right? Sometimes I think that maybe we look at Jesus and we go, well, just make me a better version of my dead self. No, if you're dead, you need to be made alive. He said, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. So he came to buy us back, to redeem us from death, to revive us, okay? Now that we're revived, what? why did he revive us? So that he could graft us back into God's creative purpose for his people. Man, it's so important we don't lose sight of that. You know, we, people, Jesus said, I came that you, you know, would have life and freedom, but, but Jesus didn't die to make us free to be free to do what we wanted. He died to redeem us to revive us, and to graft us into God's purpose. He set us free. See, before we were not free to do God's will. Now we are free to do God's will. That's when we're approaching the altar. God, your purpose, your plans, what you predestined for your people, we want to walk and to live in that. We are approaching your altar. That's why Jesus died. That's why Jesus died. I need to never forget that because as soon as I forget why Jesus died, entitlement starts to creep in. Have you ever felt like God owed you something? Boy, I have. Like, God, I've been working really hard. This is how you can tell when you're in the try harder gospel. I've been working really hard, God, and you really haven't shown up the way I thought you would. You're really not doing the things I thought you would do when I started doing this. That's a try harder gospel. You need to examine that and go, I need to put this away. Because I am called not to be a better version of me, not to make God a debtor to me, but to honor him and to love others the way I recognize I have been loved by God. He gave a greater love than I had. See, that was the substance of the first two commands was that I needed to exercise my love towards God, my love towards my neighbor. Guess what? My love runs out. 
That's why the law could never complete it. So Jesus comes along and he goes, okay, I'm going to give you a new commandment. God's going to give you a greater love, and I want you to become a conduit of that love to your neighbor. So it's not about you anymore. It's about the greater love of God, right? So we have this altar. We've been looking at this. We've been looking at it. And that's good. Uh, John, i read it again. John 13, 34 and 35, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. Very interesting, the, 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 the sentence is flipped from the first two commands, but really it's an expounding of, like now you have the ability to love because of the love that has come on you. Right? It's not your love anymore, it's God's love. You've been given greater love, love out of that. That He says, so even as I have loved you, that you love one another, by this all men will know that you are my, my disciples, if you have love one for another. What love is he talking about? Because it's easy to flip the switch at the end of that sentence and go, oh, it's my love for my neighbor. No, it's God's love for my neighbor. This is how they know you're my disciples, because you have my love for your neighbor, not a better version of your love. And that's, that, you know what that requires? That requires a lot of dependence on God. The more we know him, the more dependent we become on him, not the more independent we become in our knowledge of him. Oh, God, I'm going to love... I, I had to do this this week. You go ask my wife today. Yesterday, Friday night, I got a text. I got an email from somebody that just gets under my skin. And so I went to court in my head. And Cassandra could tell I was bothered. And I knew I was bothered. And I began to think about what I've been preaching. And I'm like, God, if I try to do this in my strength, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a miserable guy all weekend because I'm just going to think about this and think about this and how I'm right and how they're wrong. God, you've called me to love my neighbor with your love. It doesn't mean I have to feel good about what they're doing, but it just means I can put them in your hands and say, God, would you, would you touch them? Would you change their heart? And now, God, I'm going to praise you and go on because they don't determine the substance of my life, right? And, and uh, I, I, you know, man, God, thank you that you watch over me. Thank you that you are my rear guard. Thank you that those who abide in your house will eat from the abundance of your house. Um, and, and I just begin to practice this. I go, God, I want to be a conduit of your love, not of the sewage that flows into my phone through the internet. Right? All right, so I'm practicing this. I'm not saying it's easy, but it is true. It is true. Um. So we have this, uh, John 13, 34, and 35, anchors God's primary purpose for his followers in his love. We got to know that. God's purpose is anchored in his love, not in my love. God's purpose is anchored in his love, not my ability. God's purpose is anchored in his love that we received in Christ. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, right? So and John 13, 34, and 35 anchors us there. It anchors God's purpose. It anchors this altar in Christ, okay? And then we, we looked at Romans 12, 1 and 2, and Hebrews 13, 1 through 10. And these two passages of strict... <laughs> my tongue, my tongue, where's it at? Call us to live and be transformed at this altar. So, so the, the command defines the altar, Right? This is God's purpose. This is God's purpose. But then Romans, Paul speaks, and then in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews um, speaks, and they, they tell us how to live and be transformed at this altar. Again, it's not enough to just recognize there is an altar and say, yeah, I think I go there. Something should happen at the altar, right? When people went to the altar in Jerusalem, they knew exactly what was going to happen. And I think God wants us to know exactly what's going to happen to us when we approach this altar. We're going to be transformed. We are not going to be better versions of me. We're going to be changed. A caterpillar is not a caterpillar when it goes through the metamorphosis. It's a butterfly. Two different critters. And this is the same language that's used in Romans 12. Be transformed. Be transformed. So when we come to that altar, we should expect transformation. When I approach the word of God, I should expect transformation. When I approach prayer, I should expect transformation. God, change me. Make me what you created me to be. I want your purposes thriving in my life. Help me to see it how you see it, not how I see it. 
right? So we get this. Uh, another thing I, I like in, um, in, in Romans 12, it, it says that to know the perfect will of God, right? Part of, part of coming to this altar is that we would know the perfect will of God for which his great mercy Um, man, I wrote that. There's something I really want to say there. To know the perfect will of God for which his great mercy has been manifest to us in Christ Jesus. It says, in view of the mercies of God, do these things. The reason God is merciful to us is because he wants us to understand his perfect plan. That's what it says in Romans 2. Well, his perfect plan has to do with his creative command for your life. It's his purposes. And so the mercies of God open the doors for us to see. But we have to respond to the mercy. I don't have to try harder. I need to respond to the mercy. God has given me his mercy. God has given me his grace. I need to fall on that. Oh, God, help me to see the way you see. Help me to respond to your altar. Help me to respond to Jesus' purpose in living and dying so that I could be redeemed, revived, and grafted in and that I could bear fruit that brings you glory. This is not about me, is it? It's not about me. I am a part of what God has created. He loves me, but it's about him. God, this is about you. Can you find in Revelation where anybody stands up in his throne room and says, hey guys, look at me. Can you find that anywhere? What happens when we get in his presence, really? We fall down and we declare who he is, right? I want my life to be a living declaration of who he is. And that's what John says in his letter of 1 John. He says, this is our confidence in judgment, right? When I stand before God, here's gonna be the confidence. As he is, my confidence now. So are we in this world, right? The only way I can be like him in this world is if I'm abiding in his love, right? Because that's where his purpose is right here. All right, man, Esther Brent, get moving, get moving. All right, I want to get to something. This, this calls us to transformation. The third thing that we discovered in Romans 12 and Hebrews 13 was that this transformational living around this altar. This is what we should expect. When we approach the altar of God's purpose, built upon God's purposes, built upon the command that Jesus gave that we would operate in the love of the Father. This isn't try harder, I don't produce it. God gave it, I yield to it. I yield to it. I remember, we talked about, it's good to remember what you've been forgiven. Matter of fact, we're commanded to remember what we've been forgiven, not for the sake of feeling bad, but just for understanding the mercies of God. You can't view the mercies of God if you don't remember what you've been forgiven because mercy can only be given to a guilty person. Mercy, mercy isn't given to somebody that's not guilty. That's why I love Jesus' command, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Like, don't forget to extend mercy because don't forget what you've been forgiven of. <laughs> Right? Those who are merciless, judgment will be without mercy. In view of God's mercy, offer yourself. Offer yourself. Living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Right? What, what makes my sacrifice acceptable? I understand who he is and what he's done. And I fall on him again and again and again. All right. So, um, so I want to I want to kind of I want to draw us into something. We've been been looking at this altar. Why are we there? How do we how do we live around this altar? What should we expect? But I, I want to say something. And I'm going to draw on this heavily in the following weeks. I've alluded to this a little bit. Do you know the Bible is not just a, a compilation of information? that we are to try to take and to use to live out to make things happen. You know that to me. Times I think we treat the word of God like that. Oh, God, give me this information. So now I'm going to treat it like every other information. I'm going to use it to my benefit. I'm going to use it to make things better. 
Scripture is, a, is the living out of the story that God has written. Are you with me? There's a story. It starts in Genesis, goes clear to Revelation. We're not there yet, getting close. But it's a story, and it's the story of redemption. What do we see in Jesus? Jesus and his disciples, we see the living out of the story. You, know, you want to know what the book of Acts is? The book of Acts is the story of how the disciples lived out the resurrection. That's what it is. And so this isn't a bunch of information that we just need to try to memorize. We need to look and go, I'm a part of the story. I am living out the story of Acts in my life right now as I live. It, it hasn't changed. You go, look, isn't it interesting in Hebrews? Chapter 11, what is that? That's the, that's the chapter we call chapter of faith, like the heroes of faith. And then in chapter 12, it picks up and it says, therefore, since you are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Who's the cloud of witnesses? Those who went before them that are watching on. It's a picture of a coliseum. That's, that's the language that's used, right? And so we have, we have these people that have gone on before us in the story, and now it says that they're watching. Why? Because we are living out the story of the resurrection in our lives. In our lives. This is not a bunch of information put together so we can go out and make things happen the way we want them to happen. Many, many, many of us are waiting for a resurrection in our lives. Not the resurrection of Jesus. That's accomplished. Our eternity is settled. But I want you to see today as we go through this that we are living out a story, right? And Jesus told us some things about the story, and I think they're things we forget. And because we forget, we get discouraged, and we begin to try to use the word of God and faith and worship to make us feel better about what's going on than just rather than realizing, if I'll go back and read the story, what I'm going to find out is there's other people who did this before me, and here's how it happened in their lives. Jesus gave them a command to come around this altar so they would know how to live as they're waiting for the resurrection. How many of you need a resurrection in one area or another of your life? I do. You know, I used to feel bad about that. Like, if I was doing this all right, wouldn't God show up and make me feel okay about it? Show me that promise in Scripture. I can't find it. Matter of fact, the closest, closer Jesus gets to the cross, you start reading in John chapter 12, and here's what he tells him. He tells him all this bad stuff, and he goes, I told you all this so that my joy could be in you. Don't be disheartened, neither be discouraged. I would have looked at him like that too, right? What are you talking about? Like, let's just get on with the plan, right? All right, so, so we got a story. Do you know that for any story to be a good story or any great story, you have to have three parts at work? At least these three have to be evident, and you look at a good story, you'll find this. So you, one, you have to have circumstances, right? Those are part of the story. Uh, you have, let me, let me go back to my, I want to make sure I get it right so I don't keep changing the vernacular on you as you go through. Um, yep, you have circumstances. You have time, right? And you have place. Circumstances, time, and place. You have to have all three of those in a story. And if you put those three together, you get this little thing we call context, right? It's the context of the story. And I want to do a little exercise. You guys are going to participate. <coughs> I want you to help me out. So I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a, a little line out of a story, and I want to get some feedback from you. I want to I want to see what you think. So anyway, keep this in mind. In a story, we have circumstances, we have time, we have place. And in place, when I say place, don't just make that a general location. Place is really a setting that things happen in. It's, it's a setting. It includes location, but it's more than that. And place really affects time, and it also affects circumstances. Uh, it's a big one, this thing of place. And I want to give the altar place. I want it to have place. Um, we've talked about the time of the altar. When's the time? Now. Now is the time. Now is the day of salvation, it says in Hebrews 4, right? Where's the place? Or where's the, uh, what are the circumstances? Circumstances. Circumstances. We've been given the circumstances of the altar. We've looked, right? And, and part of the circumstances, we're going to get more. But really the place, I want it to have place because place defines so much. 
define so much. It can change the story altogether and how we view the story. So let's do this little exercise together. All right. Are you ready? You got your ears on. I want you to listen. I want you to turn on the little flat screen TV in your mind. You're going to get a picture, and then we're going to talk about this picture for a minute. All right? Actually, I want you to close your eyes. Close your eyes. You got the screen on. Turn the football game off. Right? Blank screen. Blank screen. Here we go. The elderly woman gave $25 to the family of five in Central Park. Got TV screen on? The elderly widow woman. I, I left that out. I'm sorry. The elderly widow woman gave $25 to the family of five in Central Park. One more time. The elderly widow woman gave $25 to the family of five in Central Park. Okay? Do you have your picture? Do you have your picture? Okay. You can open your eyes. I would like a few people just to give me one um, smattering of the picture. What did you see? When you, when you heard that, uh, maybe you can describe the setting. Maybe you can describe, maybe you felt something. I mean, when I hear, I think maybe, like for me, let me start. So I hear the word park. When I think of park, right, that's the word that kind of grabbed me. I think of a bench. I think of sunshine. I felt the sunshine. I felt the sunshine of the park. I saw the elderly woman sitting there, right? I think of fall when I, I don't know why, I think of the leaves. All right, so something, something like that. So somebody else, give me, a, give me a, what's one thing you thought of? Okay, she gave $5 to each person. What else did you think of? Okay. 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 What else did you guys? Wait, she's. What's that? Okay. I saw a whole family. I saw a mom and a dad and three kids. That's what I. Thought they were handing money to the parents. Money for food? Okay. Okay, good time. Can I ask this? What did you feel as you saw that picture? Was it good or was it despairing? Wood, wonderful. Okay. Okay. What I didn't give you in that little line was place. Now, I know Central Park, but that's place is a setting. It's not just a location. Now, the location is going to be very important in place. But now let me finish this so you have the context of place because I want you to understand how important it is that your altar has place. It defines how we read the story. Listen to this because it changes everything. Now, I did this on purpose, but... Let me find it. The elderly widow woman gave $25 to the family of five in Central Park in the height of the Great Depression. Now, now the scene changes because an elderly woman in the height of the Great Depression with $25 is without help. And Central Park was a place of great despair of rioting, of murder. The stench was horrible because of the living conditions and the family of five that would have been there would have been a desperate family. There's nothing happy about the scene anymore, is there? Because it has place. Because it has place. And so many times, isn't it funny that when we don't have that information solidified for us, that we'll make it up as best as it seems to us. And can I tell you that we do that with the altar of God? When we don't have the place set that we've been given the altar, we make it up to best suit us 
And, and just as people, I'm not saying this is wrong, but we want to feel good. And so we will make that altar a feel-good place, and then we'll expect it to operate that way. You want to know why? Because we haven't had it set in place. So I want to give the altar place, because it does have place. Jesus told us where the place was. But I'd just as soon rewrite the story so that it better fits what I would have to have happen. So let's... Give it some place. You see how that works? Isn't that interesting that the place... Now, did that place affect the circumstances? Oh, most certainly. Central Park today, still a dangerous place if you're at there at the wrong time. But Central Park then, you weren't there unless you were at the bottom of the barrel. Right? Um, $25 in the Great Depression, like that's my bank account today. Right? Um, it, it, It just, when you give it place... The story, how you interpret the story and how you live that story out and how you experience that story is different. It's different. So let's give this altar some place. We have time. We have circumstances. Let's give it some place. Because we need to know that we are all living out the story God has written. Scripture is the written account of how others lived out this story and we are called to live it out with them. What is the place of our story? Once we know the place, the story becomes alive and vibrant, and we will move away from our tendency to assign place that seems best to us. I just want to keep going. I didn't hear many amens. (laughs) Pastor, pray for the food. Ephesians 5, Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2 and Romans 12, 1. I'm going to read a couple because I want to give you the place. I want to give you the place. I want to set up the place. And I may condense the rest of my notes so I can give you the kind of the end of this. We might revisit it again. So Ephesians 2, let me read this to you, 1 through 5. Now we've talked about some of this today, so... So listen, kind of see if you can pick up on some of the things we've alluded to today and over the last couple of weeks. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. What is that? What is that? Isn't that a remembering of the mercies of God? Right? It's not a reminder of how bad I was, even though it is. But not for the sake of shame, but for the sake of rejoicing in God's greatness, right? So Paul tells the Ephesians, remember, Remember, remember where you came. Remember the mercies of God. Don't ever forget the mercies that have been given you, because this is the love that you're called to live out of. And as soon as you lose sight of it, you lose sight of what it really means to follow Christ. Okay. So, and you were dead in your trespass and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Among them too, all formerly lived in the lusts of the flesh indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in what? Mercy. Because of his great what? Love with which he loved us. Isn't that the love that we're told to live out of in the great new command? Right? Love one another the way I have loved you. Live out of the greater love that's been given you rather than out of your own love and your own strength. Live out of the strength of God's love. So Paul brings that back into the Ephesians, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Okay, now I, I'm, I'm going to read from Romans 12.1. We're setting place. We're setting place. Um, let me read Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your proper, true and proper worship. Okay? It refers to the altar. refers to the mercies of God again, though, doesn't it? Now, now, Paul speaks to the Ephesians on the side where I'm dead. Right? Remember. Remember the death that you lived in. Paul speaks to the Romans on another side setting place, and he speaks from the side of life. 
right? He speaks of us being empowered to do something. Paul will do the same thing in Ephesians, but these are two different perspectives. It's kind of like, you should know this about Scripture. Uh, So many times people say Scripture contradicts itself. And uh, I was listening to a guy, he's on Netflix. I used to be a detective. And he said, it really doesn't. He goes, actually, he goes, detectives that go out and do detective work, if they get the same exact story from a couple different people, they know that it's wrong because they've planned this. He goes, it's never the same. He goes, when you have an accident, you talk to one person standing on that corner and one person standing on that corner. They both saw the accident, but they saw different aspects of the accident. And so they give a report on the same accident, but they give different details because of where they were standing, right? And he goes, that's when we know a story is true. And so he goes, when we look at scripture, he goes, if a detective looks at it, he goes, yeah, this is true because it's all the same story. It's just people were standing in different places when they saw it. Right? He goes, this, this is real stuff. So same thing, Paul coming from two different angles. So if, if you think about that, you think about the side where we see death and we think about the side where we see life, what could be the place setting for this altar? It's the cross. Do you know the cross has two sides? And Jesus, he spoke about this. Paul says, remember, remember who you were. Which side of the cross do I have to stand on to remember who I was? I have to stand on the death side. You want to know why? Because, and, and as Jesus is talking to his disciples in John 13, he's standing on the death side of the cross, isn't he? He's looking towards the cross. And Paul says, remember who you were because you're living out a story And he goes, the cross is part of your story. Matter of fact, if you look in Luke chapter 9, and we'll read it, Jesus said, anyone who's going to come after me must take up his cross and follow me daily. I like that Luke said daily. Luke was a physician, and he gives us the prescription of the great physician, that daily this cross is part of your life. The cross is the setting for the altar. Now, the cross has a death side, doesn't it? If we step on to the other side of the cross and we look at the backside, what does that represent? What does the backside of the cross represent? What do we see on the backside of the cross? Resurrection. Resurrection. The backside of the cross represents resurrection. And Jesus said, you're carrying a cross that has two sides. There's a side that represents death. There's a side that represents resurrection. So in John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus wants to help us set the place at the cross. And so what's he tell us? He says, in this world, you will have what? Troubles. What is Jesus looking at? He's looking at the death side of the cross. He goes, you know what? The cross that I'm asking you to take them, carry, I'm about to go there. And there's troubles. But he said, I want you to take heart. Why? Because I have overcome this world, he said, I'm going to show you that this cross has a resurrection side. But never forget that you're living out a story. We're all living out a story. Jesus was raised from the dead. He has settled eternity forever. He has dealt with the wages of sin. Amen. Resurrection life awaits. But what did Jesus say in John? He says, but in this world, you're still going to have to deal with the death side of the cross. All of you at some point are going to need a resurrection in your life. And it's not that you've done something wrong. It's just the nature of this world. But take heart because I have the power of resurrection. You want to know why that's so important? Because sometimes if we don't understand where the altar's set, When we come to the altar, how do we treat people who are waiting for a resurrection? We treat them poorly. How do we feel? I don't even feel like I should come to the altar because there's so much death in my life. Well, you're waiting for a resurrection, so come to the cross. Because on the backside of the cross, there is resurrection. The cross is the setting for this altar that we have been called to, and the devil has duped us. Now, I'm telling you, 
I have gone through some unnecessary seasons. Okay, I've done some dumb things. If you sow bad seed, don't be deceived. God won't be mocked. You're going to reap what you sow. But you know what? There are times in life where the disciples doing anything wrong following Jesus, were they? Did they experience death? Sure did. And so we have this new command. Why did we get the new command? So that we could alter the story and make everything come out good. No, Jesus said, here's what I want you to do. Recognize how I loved you. And while you're waiting for the resurrection, love one another the way I've loved you. He didn't give us this information so we could make the story come out the way we want it to come out. He said, I'm going to give you the power to love in the face of death. Because the resurrection is on the way. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. You know what we need to be able to say sometimes instead of, oh, look how bad it is? Oh, I can't wait for the resurrection that's coming. I can't wait to sit down at the right hand because that's my hope. Not that everything's going to work out in this world the way I want it. I have a resurrection that's on the way, and he is sure, and he told me to take heart because he's already overcome the death. Now I'm waiting for the other side of the cross and the resurrection. Sometimes we see it here, don't we? That's good. I'm not saying that's bad, but I'm I'm just saying we get kind of turned around in how we think about what it means to follow Christ. Let me show you what I mean. We're not far from lunch. Bear with me. I want to I'll put, this, put this up on the screen. Maybe this was part of my notes that I highlighted. I said, oftentimes we spend far too much time and energy trying to rewrite the story in an effort to change the setting of place. When what we really need to do is just come near to the altar of God's purpose and live by the power of his love shed on us in Christ while we live out God's story awaiting the resurrection. We spend far too much time and energy trying to rewrite the story. Jesus told us that the setting was the cross for this altar. Um, You know, when you give the altar the setting of the cross, what we understand is it's not always a party, is it? It's not always good feelings, is it? Sometimes it is. I'm not not against that. But I get discouraged when things aren't going the way I thought they would go. I have a statement I want to give you. I'm going to skip down, down through here. The gospel is the good news of how we are to live in this world as we wait for a resurrection. It's not our power to create the resurrection. Who's the only one that can give life? God. He's the only one that can give life to the dead. That's his job. My job is to continue living in the love that I've been given while I wait for the resurrection to happen. Right? That gives me a whole different perspective on life. That gives me a whole different perspective on tough situations. Oh, this isn't God's punishment. No, Jesus said, you, I'm going to have some tribulations, right? Some stuff's going to happen on this side of the cross. But Jesus promised a resurrection. Many times, our obedience and practice of faith only seems to lead to what we consider hard times and the death of dreams. But it's by no means meant to be processed as a punishment, but rather as the tribulations Jesus said he had overcome. Then we are living out the story of the resurrection in our everyday lives. So I was contemplating all this a few weeks back. This is what I just really want to then get to. And I thought of of Jesus' 12 disciples. I thought of these 12 disciples because they're real people, aren't they? They could have just as well had your name. They're real people. They're not figments. They're not people that were made up. They're real people, just like us, right? And that's how I view them. I think, man, God, why did you pick these knuckleheads? (laughs) 
And then, and then I'm encouraged and I go, God, I understand I can have a part too, right? You picked real people. I'm thinking about them and what they experienced and what really transpired with them in God's economy between Jesus' new command and Jesus' resurrection. So between John 13 and Jesus' resurrection, some things happened with these real people that set the place of the altar in their lives. Okay? And I think we need to understand this because this is real. This is something you should go back and you should think about this again and again and again and just let it soak in and let God really bring this to life in you. These were people who loved God. I want you to get this because, I mean, they made mistakes. I'm not making them perfect, but I think they were doing the two great commands that Jesus was asked about. So they were people who loved God with their strength, people who tried hard to love each other in their own strength, right? We see them doing that, right? They were people who had plans and dreams, right? Did the disciples have plans and dreams? When they followed Jesus, did they have plans and dreams? Yes or no? <clears throat> they sure did. <clears throat> Jesus is going to set up a kingdom. They had, they had a flat screen TV in their head too of what this was going to look like. You want to know why? Because they didn't have the setting yet. They had plans and dreams for this try harder way of living. They were people who had made great sacrifices to see the kingdom come into the place they desired. That's what I think, and I, I don't think anybody in this room could point at them and go, oh, they were bad people for doing that. We do it all the time. I got plans for Jesus. Don't I? Sure I do. And of their... All of their, I put here, because I'm thinking about them, and you got to consider this because they've, they've got dreams, they've got plans, they've got all this stuff going on, they've sacrificed, they've given. And then comes the cross, they get the setting, and all of their Jesus-following dreams died on the front side of that cross. Do you think they were discouraged? Do you think they were disheartened? Do you think they had a lot of why questions? Jesus told them, this is the setting for my life. Do you think they felt like worshiping in that moment? Absolutely not. Matter of fact, within a couple of days, Peter's ready to go back to being a fisherman. They're disheartened. As I was thinking about all of this, the Spirit of God whispered something because he wanted to give me perspective on the place of the altar and why it's important that we continue to worship there in community with one another when it seems like everything has died that we thought would happen. Here's what the Spirit of God said. The times will come when the Jesus you thought you were following must die. So that in the resurrection, you can see the Jesus the Father has really given you. Do you know that the Jesus they were following was not the Jesus the Father had given them? Not the one they saw. When did they see the Jesus the Father had given them? In the resurrection. Did God give them back their dreams or did he resurrect his purposes and plans? He resurrected his purposes and plans for their life. Theirs were still dead. So in the resurrection that you're waiting for, don't wait for God to resurrect your plans and your dreams. Say, God, give me the Jesus in the resurrection that you've really given me. Help me to see him as he is, not as I see him. Help me to know him as he is in your presence, seated at your right hand, victorious, resurrected, conquering death. Because honestly, most of my plans and dreams could die anyway if you gave them to me. We are all living out the story of the resurrection. And what we are waiting for is not for God to give us what we want, but we are waiting for God to show us the Jesus he has really given us. God, let me see him in the power 
of his resurrection. Right? Isn't that the Christ we're told to hope in? Is the one who was resurrected? I don't hope in the Jesus before the cross. I hope in the Jesus that came after the cross because that's where we saw who he really was. That's where we saw the power he really had. That's where we saw the glory the Father had bestowed on him. And for the joy set before him, he endured that cross. Listen, there's coming days, and maybe you're in them, when you got to endure a cross, but don't endure it so you can have what you want. Endure it for the joy set before you. I'm going to have. I'm going to have. The reality, I mean, we already have the Christ that God has given us, but we don't see him very clearly sometimes. And I'm praying, God, help me to see you as you are. I know that will never fully happen until I get there. But God, I'm so tired of this blurry image that I have, and I'm so tired of living and trying to manipulate you and trying to quote your word and trying to worship you and trying to pray you into doing the things that I want. And then I watch him die, and I get this heart, and I ask all these why questions. The Spirit of God goes, well, the time comes when the Jesus you thought you were following is going to die. Just like the disciples, because they had to live out the story of the resurrection, so do you. So let it die, because it wasn't God's plan for you in the first place. Now, Let's get on to the resurrection. Let's get on to waiting for the resurrection because this is the setting for the altar. A group of people living together, waiting for the resurrection. You know what we're commanded to do? We're commanded to know one another's name. We're commanded to carry one another's burdens. We're commanded to walk together as we wait for the resurrection. We're not commanded to fix one another. We're not commanded to tell the other guy what his problem is. I mean, there's times I'm going to speak to you in love and we're going to communicate and we're going to walk together. But it's not me standing up here and you down here. It's us here together, sharing life. And you want to know why I have compassion? Because I'm waiting for a resurrection too. Think I haven't had things die in my life? Think I haven't been disappointed? Think I haven't experienced pain? We all have. And... And honestly, God is not the God of the wise. Remember this. So many times when things happen, we just, I mean, it's not wrong. I ask why. Why, 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 why? Why'd that have to happen? Why'd that have to happen? Why couldn't it do this? Why couldn't it do that? God is not the God of the wise. He's the God of the how. Ooh, God, that is the death of a dream. How are you going to lead me to the resurrection? You've given me your word. You've put your altar in the place of the cross and you said, come follow me daily. Mark 9.23, or uh, Luke 9.23, I think is the reference for that if you wanted to find it. Jesus promised a resurrection, not of what we want, but of what we have truly been given in Christ. That's my desire. God, would you help me to know what you have truly given me in Christ? Would you help me to know the greatness of the love that I've been given in Christ so that I can be a conduit of that love? So that in the midst of the death of dreams and other things, that I'm still coming to the altar because this is really the place where I need to worship. Not just by myself, but with others who are waiting for the resurrection. Encourage one another as long as it is called today. Amen. Father, we thank you that you have set the altar in a place of the cross. God, on the front side, we see you. On the front side of the cross, it's where things die. But on the back side of the cross that you've asked us to carry, there is resurrection life. And there is a Jesus raised immortal. There is a Jesus raised eternal. There is a Jesus raised untouchable where his enemies have been put under his feet. And he is the Jesus that we reach for. He is the Jesus that we have accepted. He is the Jesus whose love has been given to us and forgiven us of our sin. God, we offer ourselves to your redemptive purposes at the cross. Not only did you want to nailed the debt was, that was against us to the cross. 
but you wanted to take us to the other side and resurrect us to the life that you have had planned for us before eternity. Would you help us to worship there? God, when we see the shame of the cross, would we look beyond it to the joy set before us of the resurrection that you are working in our lives? And God, those resurrections, when they happen here in this life, would they just be a testimony to your power, not to our goodness, not to our ability, not to our knowledge, not to our self-righteousness, but to your power, to your ability, a testimony to the risen Christ in our lives. We thank you for that, God. I pray that you would walk with each one. God, who's many of us face not just physical deaths in this life, but the death of dreams, the death of so many things, the disappointments. And the enemy would lie, and he would say, it's because you've done this, it's because you've done that. Father, if we've transgressed against you, we ask for your forgiveness. God, we are all in a place of waiting for resurrection and so we fix our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith who will lead us in the way of life known as the good news in the face of the cross for the joy set before we thank you for all these things spirit of God would you would you work this in our hearts would you help us to gather around the altar of your purposes God that we would look for your purposes for creating us. God, that we wouldn't be just distracted by all the suckers that try to grow on the tree, sideways energy, things that aren't going to matter for eternity, things that keep us from being really fruitful in your kingdom, not outright sin, but it's just energy that could best be used in other places. Would you prune our lives? Would you make us fruitful? Would you cause us to bear fruit? For the glory of your name, would you give us the grace to live in and out of your love and to exercise the power that you put upon us in Christ that we would walk in the authority of the master and make disciples because we have been disciples. That we would love one another the way you've loved us. God, I know it's a practice. Would you lead us in it? We thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name. Father, we thank you for this time we have together today, to gather around tables, to know one another's names, to hear one another's stories, to pray with one another as we wait for resurrection together, to encourage one another as long as it is called today. God, would you bless the food? Would you bless the fellowship? God, we thank you that you listen, you listen, and God, you write down the stories of those who speak of your name. We thank you for it in Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Amen. I kept you.